We're doing a study on the Song of Solomon. We're calling it the Song of Love, the Song of Love. And in this particular lesson, we're taking from Song of Solomon chapter 3 and verse 6 to the end of the chapter. And we're calling this, Who is This? Now, in this particular song, it actually opens up the third song in Song of Solomon. As I've stated before, there's actually six songs in Song of Solomon. And beginning in chapter 3, verse 6, down through chapter 5 and verse 1, is the third song. What this is, it's three different pictures that she pulls out and shows us here of their wedding. In this particular lesson, it's the wedding procession as he is bringing his new queen to be up to the capital city of Jerusalem. And so it's describing the wedding that happens between this great king and his beautiful bride. Let, let me break this into several parts to help you remember what I'm going to share with you. Let's first of all talk about the procession. The procession, in other words, the wedding party on their way up to Jerusalem. In chapter 3 and verse 6 it says, Who is this coming up out of the wilderness like pillars of smoke, perfumed with myrrh and frankincense, with all the merchant's fragrant powder? Now what they're describing, of course, is this royal wedding party going up the mountain. This is the first time you find this phrase, who is this, in Song of Solomon. You're going to find it two more times. It's found three times. It's one of those phrases that's repeated for emphasis sake during very special moments. And so now we're approaching their wedding. This is not courtship anymore. The first uh, two and a half chapters, actually three and a half chapters, is dealing with their courtship. But now we're going to deal with the wedding. And when he, he talks about this, who is this coming up out of the wilderness, it's talking about her on the road up to Jerusalem. Because Jerusalem sits at the top of the mountains, every road leads up to Jerusalem. It's the only way to get there. You either come from the east, from over around the Dead Sea, the Jordan Valley, or you come from the west, down at the Mediterranean Sea, but all roads lead up to Jerusalem. It's built on the top of the mountain. Let me tell you something. In your relationship with God, you're going to discover the same thing. I, I remember as a young Christian, I was going through a very, very difficult situation, a problem that troubled me deeply. And I was, I was praying at an altar, and I was seeking God, all desperately seeking God. And some of the wisest advice I ever received in my life I do not even know the lady's name, but it was an elderly lady that walked up to me, taps me on the shoulder, and I look up through my tear-stained eyes, and she said to me, Son, he's not down there. He's up there. Boy, that, that changed my whole perception in life. I've never forgotten that, and that's been, oh, 50 years ago. I never forgot that. He's not down there. He's up there. And that is true in your situation, no matter what your circumstances may be. All roads lead up to Jerusalem. So it's describing the wedding party as they are making their way up to Jerusalem. The second word I want to discuss is the word provision. Provision. In the provision, look in chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. It describes this royal throne, a portable throne actually, that Solomon has had built for himself. And it said, of the wood of Lebanon, Solomon the king made himself a palaquin, which is a portable chair. He made its pillars of silver, its support of gold, its seat of purple, its interior paved with love by the daughters of Jerusalem. Now, it's in the previous verse where you saw the, all the frankincense, the incense that's being burned, in, and he called it like pillars of, of smoke. And he's actually describing these pillars of burning incense or of perfume. Now he describes 
the chair that has been made by King Solomon. This is fit for a king. This is something that is special. It, it, it's not just surrounded by the priests that are there and providing all kinds of, uh, of the religious accolades as they are burning the incense. No, this palanquin is a throne. It is made with silver and gold. He begins to describe the, the different things that he's done to make this very special. You have to understand, this is the description of a royal wedding party. They're on their way up the road to Jerusalem for the king's wedding. It's a time of celebration. I think you and I as Christians need to stop sometimes, you know, and, and all of the problems and the hassle of life. And remember, we are going to a wedding, not a funeral. That's why we, it's calls for rejoicing. It's time to celebrate. God loves us. And in his love for us, he's provided whatever we need in life. She didn't have to provide the throne. She doesn't have to provide this portable chair that they're actually carrying on. His Solomon's servants are carrying her on their shoulders. No, he provided that because of his love for her. And I really believe the same is true for us that so many times, so many times, particularly even in difficult times, God carries us. It's more than just a little poem, but it's, it's a beautiful poem that talks about footprints in the sand. And the man that went to heaven and he looks back at his life and there are two sets of footprints walking side by side. And, and uh, Jesus says to him, we walk together in the path of life. And, and he said, but what about the... There, there's difficult problems and difficult days and, and there's only one set of footprints. And the poet said it so well, it was during those difficult times, I carried you. Well, I believe that. The provision that is made for us, it, he has done everything he can to make us feel welcome. The colors that are here, the colors, they're royal colors. He mentions blue. Blue actually is called the color of heaven because of the blue skies. Then there's red. The red is the color of blood, the color of humanity. Now what happens when you mix blue and red together? You come up with the color of purple. Purple. That's the color of royalty. Kings love to use the royal color because it shows them, though I'm a man, yet God chose me. We are chosen by God. Again, he's doing everything he can. It's not just silver and gold. It's not just frankincense and myrrh and beautiful spices. It's even the colors that he chooses. This is a time of celebration because we are going to a wedding. This is a time for us to rejoice. Now, the third thing that I want to talk about that I see in these verses is what I'm going to call protection. Protection. It's very interesting. In verse 7, she says, Behold, it is Solomon's couch, or the, his portable throne, with 60 valiant men all around it. All the valiant of Israel, in other words, the very best of the Israeli guard. Now what she's describing, these 60 valiant men, is the royal bodyguards. That's what he's, she's talking about. This is Solomon's royal bodyguard that he has sent to escort her up to Jerusalem for their wedding day. Now, this is something that I, I, I see it's very wise on the part of Solomon. He knows that his bride has never experienced anything like this. He understands this is going to be overwhelming for her and her emotions. And so he sends his bodyguard to make her feel secure. 
It says in verse 8, they all hold swords being expert in war. Every man has his sword on his thigh because of fear in the night. Now what, you, what, what is she describing here in these words? It's fear in the night. Fear in the night is anything which might frighten her. Anything that makes her feel insecure. The fear of the night. Solomon understands she has a need for security. I really believe this is one of the great needs of humanity. And humanity, it's well said, when we're children, we're in that awe stage where life is wonderful. It's like watching a baby, you know, looking at his fingers and it moves. And, and a baby will just be fascinated with their own fingers. But then we begin to mature and we come into the romance stage of life. Love begins to blossom. And then, then developing what we have been able to, uh, to experience, we begin to think. As they say, you reach a point, you can't work harder. You have to learn to work smarter. But what is one of the greatest needs of humanity? It shows up in those gray years of our life when our hair begins to turn white from so many winter snows. It's security. Security. What's going to happen to me? Now let me tell you, friend, I believe with all of my heart that God has provided for our security. He has provided, and I really believe that one of the main reasons so many people are insecure, is, particularly as they get older, is what's going to happen to my social security? Let me tell you, friend, God was God before there ever was social security. He will be God after there is Security, Social Security is long gone. You've got to put your faith in God and realize God is greater than your need. That's what Solomon is doing for her. He's making her feel secure. See, first of all, he made her feel loved. Secondly, he made her feel secure. Now, this is one of the things that I've had to try to understand in life. I... I remember several years ago, this goes back many years ago, that uh, we had a particular glass door on our patio that uh, it had a lock on the door, uh, which was good enough for me, but it wasn't good enough for my wife because she could see through that. I, I believe it had something to do with that. And then the rolling of the door, you could open up the door. And so she wanted me to cut this two before and put it to block the door so that and I, I try to explain, but, but it's got a lock there. It, it, I know, but I, I, I'll, I'll feel better. Well, I finally quit trying to explain and just went and cut the two before and blocked the door. She felt so much better. Now, I, I think that we men can, can learn from this. It's not enough to explain. It's not enough to rationalize and talk about it. She must feel secure. And if she doesn't feel secure, it doesn't matter how many locks you put on it. She wants a royal bodyguard. And so what Solomon is doing here, Solomon is making her feel loved, feel secure. Now, I, I hope I'm emphasizing this correctly because I, I don't think we men understand. We, we don't think that way. But many times I've discovered that ladies, they think it through with their emotions. They feel it. And in doing so, we're, we're kind of left out of that because it doesn't matter what I feel about it. I mean, you know, facts are facts. But that, that, that's not the way the ladies look at it. And so... If, if you love someone, make them feel loved. Make them feel secure. It, it, it's, if you don't do this, then something is going to be missing in the relationship because you simply don't understand. I think of the words of the Apostle Peter when he was talking to husbands, and he said, Husbands, dwell with your wives according to knowledge. In other words, you're never going to understand it with your feelings, 
Stop trying. Just understand her. If she feels that way, then deal with the problem. So that's what Solomon is doing here. That's why he sent his own personal bodyguard. These six valiant men, they're the very finest of Israel to escort her up to Jerusalem because he wants her to feel secure. Now, let, let me talk about a fourth word here. This fourth word is what I'm going to call progression. Progression. I'm using words that start with the letter P simply because I want to help you to remember what I'm going to say. The progression. You find this in verse 11. It says, Go forth, O daughters of Zion, and see King Solomon with the crown, which his mother crowned him, on the day of his wedding. Now pay close attention to those words. On the day of the gladness of his heart. It's not talking here about his coronation to become king of Israel. No. This is not talking about that when the priest comes in and anoints him and, and the prophet comes in and sets the crown on his head. That's not what it's talking about. This is his wedding day. The day of the gladness of his heart. It's wedding day. And it was a crown that his mother gave him. So let me talk about progression. It uses the phrase here, daughters of Jerusalem. Now I personally believe that the Song of Solomon was a song written to be sung. I, I believe that it probably was performed in some sense like this. And, and uh, you have the two main voices, of course, is the Shulamith, the maiden, and then Solomon, the king. But then you have this uh, chorus of feminine voices. We know they're feminine because of the, the tense that it is written in. They are the daughters of Jerusalem. There's more than one of them. There's a group of them. And then we have, of course, her brothers. And it would be like a, a group of men that are, are joining in on this chorus. So the daughters of Jerusalem, well, what's it describing? It's describing the ladies that are lining both sides of the road watching this royal wedding procession as they are climbing the mountain of Jerusalem. They're watching. They're seeing all of this, the priest and the incense and the frankincense and the spices. And they're seeing the royal bodyguard that surrounds this portable throne that she is being carried to Jerusalem. That's what they're watching. The truth of it is, Everybody loves a beautiful wedding. I have to confess, as, as a pastor, I hated funerals. I hate funerals. I've, I've buried some of the best people I've ever known. I hate them. But I love weddings. There is nothing that, that, that is more beautiful than to see a young couple that has done it right and they have prepared themselves and this is their moment and everybody is joining the celebration of their wedding. That's what's being described here. And so the daughters of Jerusalem are lining the roads and watching to see this royal wedding procession and all of its finery, all of the, the grandeur, all the, I mean, this is the king. Actually, we could say king of kings here because there wasn't any king like Solomon. He, he, this, this man, the Bible said none of his drinking glasses were made of silver. No, they were all made of gold. His throne was something that we still talk about today because it was so magnificent. This is his wedding. And so they are, they're coming together for this wonderful celebration, celebrating love, celebrating life, and I remind you, it's not only that for King Solomon, not only was that true for your wedding, my wedding, that was a very special day that I will never forget, but it's also true for us as Christians. That's what we're headed for, is for the marriage supper of the Lamb of God. God is providing a wedding for us, and the progress we are making our love relationship with Christ is developing. You should love Jesus more today than ever before in your life. She is, she's in that progression. She's getting married. Let me talk about a fifth word here. 
This fifth word is the word I'm going to call possession. Possession. Solomon is wearing a wedding crown. Now, as I pointed out a moment ago, the scripture says, his mother gave him this crown on the day of his wedding. It was given to him on the day of the gladness of his heart. He's wearing this wedding crown. It goes back to Jewish culture, which celebrated marriage by comparing bridegrooms to kings. To kings. Now, I really think that in our culture, our, we've lost a lot of this in our culture, that weddings for so many people, you know, nothing special at all. It is special. It's special before God. And we ought to make it special. We ought to do something to celebrate it. And I think, ladies, if you understood that the, the way the fragile makeup of men and, and uh, it's it just, it, it's like my wife and I have been married for 49 years and yet I, when I will call home from wherever around the world that I'm able to contact her and I will call her and she answers the phone and then she hears it's my voice and suddenly her voice comes alive. It's like music and it is music to my ears. Nobody in the world can make me feel like that. Nobody in the world can make me feel that special. That after 49 years, she still loves to hear my voice. Oh, God help us to understand. That's the way it ought to be, not only in marriage, it ought to be in our relationship with Christ, with God in the same way. See, a wedding is more than just two people that are being joined together. Again, this is a mistake that we make in our culture. Uh, having been a pastor for so many years, I, I cannot tell you how many weddings I have performed over the years, but um, one of the things that I would always emphasize when I was counseling with a couple is, it's not just the two of you getting married. No, it's two families that are being joined together. Not just two people that are coming together, it's two families that are being joined. And I, I would say to him, it's not right for you to ask her to marry you and divorce her family. Or vice versa, it's not right for her to ask you to marry and divorce your family. And so I would encourage them, you need to work out because many times there are problems. Problems not just between the families, but problems between the, the groom and the bride, the other family doesn't like them, and uh, we talk about in-laws and outlaws, and you know, and, and, and listen, it's two families that's being joined, and they're going to be joined the rest of your life, particularly when children become involved in the situation. The children that come, you're forever going to be joined to that family. The grandchildren, it goes on, and so it's better to solve all of those problems you possibly can before you get married. Work out as many of those difficulties. Sometimes it's impossible to work out all of them, but work out as many as you possibly can before the wedding day. Because it's not just two people. It's two different families that are being joined together. And when we look at that, as particularly as you begin to age and get older in life, it becomes even more and more important to you, and it's a part of that security that we talked about. Security where he made her feel secure. So if we understand this as Christians, the same thing is true. We are headed for the marriage supper of the Lamb of God. Jesus Christ is getting married to the church, to those that have believed him and followed him. And it's going to be the greatest celebration that the world has ever experienced. The Son of God's getting married. God's going to celebrate. And we're going to be not just there to observe, we will be the bride of Christ. Oh, what a wonderful, wonderful truth that we, God's, loved us enough not just to redeem us from our sins. No, God loved us so much, he invites us to come and sit 
with him in his throne to become the bride of Christ. It's one of the greatest mysteries in all of the word of God, and yet it's one of the greatest truths. It's something that brings me great pleasure. It's something that, that I, 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 I can't even comprehend the depths of what I'm saying, and yet I believe with all of my heart it is true. Now what God has done, he's done the same thing that Solomon did for his bride. He first of all makes us feel loved. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him should not perish. Greater love hath no man than this than a man lay down his life for his friends. He's not only done that, but he makes us feel secure. Now I know I, I've, I've met believers that feel so insecure they just can't believe that God really loves them. And I've been so bad. You're putting the focus in the wrong place, friend. You need to stop thinking about yourself and start thinking about him. Start thinking about Jesus. Stop putting yourself first. Start putting God first in your life. And it will bring that security. I'm not afraid of losing my salvation because I've discovered better than holding on to Jesus is Jesus holding on to me. And the safest place I can be is in his hand. I have people ask me from time to time, are you afraid to go here, afraid? No, the thing that, that I fear more than anything else is displeasing him. The thing I fear the most is to miss his will, to not obey. God, help us to understand this in our spiritual journey and to understand how much God loves us. He not only makes us feel loved, he makes us feel secure. May God bless you in your Christian journey.